Well, you're on th this, but you're not on line. It's just on the waiting screen. And you're muted, you're not. Oh. Can't sit with, oh. Can I sit where you normally sit? Why? Uh, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> I Yeah, what's that? You said what? I said, yeah, what's good, though? What'd you do today? Uh, yeah, at school? Um, I showed up on campus to find out that I had an email that was saying that all classes are closed today. Dude, I even got that. What? I got that imp, that alert. Oh, for, <laughs> from, for, from her account? Yeah. That's funny. Is Brookdale a public campus? Like, where, like, you know, like these guys mm -hmm. go on campus as a creep? Yep. Like a square, is that like a square? Is there, uh, is there a spot where kids walk? I just know there's no yeah, there, there's traffic, but I don't know if there's not really like a spot. There's not like a spot, like it's no. yeah, CSI by, that was by the um, but I'm saying it's all like sidewalk, like it doesn't really open, didn't like open up to a port. Uh, LAH over by LAH, yep. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> something, I don't think about that. yeah. 
me and uh, me and Dad were talking about like, man, if, if we had the property across from Brookdale, man, we'd be yeah. 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 So I, I don't know. It might be just be coincidence. Might be the weather, but. On my drive back from Brookdale, I passed by Lincroft and then there was home down, I think. I always knew there was like this uh, alphabet suit flag out front, oh, yeah. and I'm, I'm always like, driving back. And then I saw it and it wasn't there, and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, the wind took it? Yeah, the wind probably took it, but I was like, hey, that's not bad. They always get knocked down, those flags. Yeah. Yeah, be ready. Good. All right, good evening, everybody. We're going to get started here. Am I okay online, too? All right. Mr. Andino, if you wouldn't mind uh, doing the honors back there so we don't get let everybody in. All right, we'll give you a few announcements. Actually, I have about a gazillion announcements, but I'll, I'll just say them quickly, and uh, we'll jump into it. We're so close, I'm... I'm like getting close to the end of the Bible here. I'm like, I see a light. Just don't want it to be a train. All right, so here we go. Uh, let me give you the stuff happening this weekend because there's a lot and you could plug in wherever it fits. But tomorrow night we have our youth group are getting together, uh, our inaugural meeting uh, at, the, at the Mancini's. Uh, they, they're jumping in to, so we could add another Friday to our youth group so we can meet three different times. So we'll do one week. My editors are doing a week, and the Mancini's are doing a week, so Mancini's are going to take the first Friday of every month, so Jason's got uh, fire, food, and fellowship lined up, so he's going to have a bonfire and buy some food and open up the Bible and do some games and stuff. He and So anybody's invited. I think he might even invite the college people, too. I, I'm not sure. You've got to ask him. Um, then Saturday morning, uh, if you're in Discipleship 2 class, we have that starting at 9 a.m. for breakfast and 9.30 is class and then if you're not in that class and you want to do OJ, Operation Jerusalem is at 10 a.m. I'll be home. And then Saturday evening, uh, if you're a hooper, we have our basketball ministry. I'm um, looking out, seeing all those hoopers in the room. Uh, anybody wants to be in that, that's at 6 to 9 in the gym in Spotswood. You could talk to Chris about that. And then keeps going. Then Sunday morning, we have breakfast here if anybody wants to come a little early. Uh, between 9.15, 9.30, you could come. And um, I still have the sign-up sheet there on that table over there. If anybody wants to bring anything, you could text me or write it down. Um, we have some stuff signed up, but you're welcome to add to that. And then on Sunday during the service, we're taking the Lord's table, so prepare your heart for that. And then if your heart gets really prepared, you might want to go minister after the service. We have Bayshore Health Center at 1.30 right down the block if you want to go spread some of the blessings. Uh, and then... Sunday night, this is really only for a select group, but I haven't really said anything about it, but some of the guys that play basketball from our church and a lot of guys, the brothers from the Staten Island Church, uh, really wanted to play competitively, so they've joined a league, a men's league, at, uh, through the Monroe Sports Center, and uh, their first game is um, Sunday night. So they are the, uh, they are the redeemed team, and... Uh, Actually, that's one of the jerseys my wife was making. So they got, uh, got the jerseys there. They got John 316 in the corner. They got a QR code to our website, our salvation page on the jersey. You know, that's, that's looking good. They got, this is Steven's jersey. I don't know if he's actually going to play, but this is his. Uh, but anyway, so that said, um, pray about that because they want to try to be a blessing. They better be. They got John 316 on their jerseys. <laughs> they better not. I said, I like to chirp. I wouldn't, couldn't put John 3.16 on my jersey, but they got John 3.16 on the jersey and redeemed on the center, so they better not be complaining with the refs or like talking trash to anybody. Uh, but they're trying to be a blessing and maybe to the refs and maybe the teams, just maybe give them a track at the end and just kind of, you know, be a blessing. And so uh, their first game is Sunday night at 8.45. I think you're playing at uh, that central jersey, which is right here in Marlboro. It's probably 10 minutes away. So I'll text that if anybody wants to go crash that and don't bring any pom-poms but if anybody wants to come and root them on that's that's Sunday night and then there's a ladies fellowship later this month uh, the 26th of April the Spurgeons are coming I feel like uh, Paul Revere when I say that but the Spurgeons are coming uh, the 18th and the 19th of May I sent out one 
one RSVP about the breakfast. I'm going to send another one shortly about uh, Church in the Park, which is the 19th. And then we have youth camp later on in July. Um, that enough? That enough commercials for one night? <laughs> That's a lot of commercials. Um, and then just pray for uh, just pray for uh, pray for Israel. You pray for the nation of Israel, our country as well. Our faiths are somewhat intertwined, and um, um, as we've been a friend to Israel, God always blesses us. And as we scorn Israel, God always seems to smack us a little bit. So just pray that our leaders are not as stupid as they look, um, that they would just, you know, maintain those godly relationships and have wisdom. Continue to pray for Mark, Ron's brother Mark, um, dealing with that illness and sickness, and um, many others. There's a young boy, Rocco. We prayed for a bunch of people on, on Tuesday night. Um, uh, Deborah's mom, Barbara, she's in, right? She's moved in to Spring Hills. That's a blessing. Um, that's good. Just pray for her salvation, and uh, just continue to pray for Maurice. I, I got a text that I heard from him. He seems like he's doing okay, like he's safe. It seems like he's laying low, and he's just waiting to see, like, which way it goes in Haiti. You know, he thanked us for praying um, over those eight days. I hope you continue to pray, and, you know, he, he, right now he can't leave. Like, his wife doesn't have a passport, so he obviously wants to do things honestly, and, and for men, so he can't leave the country so and come to America, so uh, the circumstances don't line up. So just pray that he gets an answer either way. If the Lord wants him to come home, that he opens the door for his wife to get a passport. If not, that he just finds what direction he's supposed to go. Um, Giacomo and Taylor Galeotto, uh landed in Sicily on Tuesday night. Was it Tuesday they left? They left Tuesday afternoon, right? So that they're, they're, in, they're in Sicily. Um, and do continue to pray, if you don't mind, continue to pray for my brother-in-law, Dave Carbocci, still like recovering health-wise and just has a host of things he's dealing with. So just appreciate your prayers in that area. All right, so let's, um, let's pray and then we'll jump into 3 John. 3 John. All right, let's pray it up. Lord, we love you tonight and we thank you and we praise you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're the creator of all things, Lord. Thank you that you think of us and your thoughts are ever towards us, Lord. It's hard to imagine, Lord, with this big world with all the things happening and all the things that have to be held up, and all even the, just the systems in our body, Lord, that have to function properly so that we could live, Lord. You're, you're upholding all those things by the word of your power. And yet, Lord, the thoughts towards us are more than we can count, Lord. That's truly an amazing thing, Lord. Help us to believe that. Help us to remember that. Lord, we pray for our nation, Lord. Um, I know by all outward indicators, Lord, she looks like a real mess, Father. People at the wheel look like the inmates are truly running the asylum, as Lester Roloff said many years ago. But... We pray for President Biden and Kamala Harris and Chuck Schumer, Lord, and, and Mike Johnson, Father, and these, these people in power, Lord, our own governors here, Governor Murphy, Lord, and our mayors and our magistrates and our various towns, Lord. Just protect your people, Lord. Let us be able to lead that quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, Father. We think, Lord, of, uh, of Mark, Lord, as he's continuing to just deal with that illness, Lord, and the, the deteriorating effects of it. Pray you comfort him, Lord, encourage him. Thank you for the encouragement you gave him Sunday afternoon, Lord, just making those things about his salvation sure, Father, from the word of God. We praise you for that, Lord, that he said he walked out feeling so much better. Lord, we give you all the glory for that, Lord, that you just comfort your saint, your child, be very near to him and the family, Lord. And we think, Lord, of, uh, of Maurice, Father, out there in Haiti, and Gerda and David and Paul, that we just ask, Lord, please, that you might protect him and direct him, Lord, and give him that plain path because of his enemies, Father. Uh, he's the, truly, you prepare a table before him in the presence of his enemies. I pray that you might make it very plain and clear. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, let's uh, open up to 3 John. 3 John, verse 1. There's only one chapter, so... 3 John 1. <clears throat> All right. Get going on me like this. Go. So we got one chapter, 14 verses, 294 words. I think I said last week, probably mistakenly, and I want to correct myself, that <clears throat> 2 John was the shortest book in the Bible. I might have said that, but 2 John has less, verse, less verses and more words. It's 13 verses in 2 John, but 298 words. And 3 John... There's 14 verses, but 294 words. So technically, 3 John is the shortest book 
in your Bible. Um, <clears throat> it's written by John the Apostle um, around 90 A.D. He's an old man then. And you notice in 3 John verse 1 that the letter is addressed to Gaius, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. And there are five individuals named Gaius in your New Testament. All right? uh, in Acts 19.29, there is Gaius of Macedonia. In Acts 20 verse 4, there is Gaius of Derby. In Romans chapter 16, verse 23, there is Gaius, mine host, somebody that hosted Paul and took Paul, I guess, into his home. In 1 Corinthians 1, 14, there's a man that Paul baptized from the church in Corinth named Gaius. He baptized a man named Gaius. And then here in 3 John, it looks like Gaius may have been a convert of John. Because you notice in verse 4, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And he's speaking about Gaius there. So usually when a guy like Paul or John is speaking about my children, he's not speaking about physical offspring, but spiritual offspring, people that they've led to Christ. So the first two seem to be somebody unique. Gaius of Derby and Gaius of Macedonia seem to be two separate people. But it looks like the last three could be the same person. Uh, so if we say they're the same person, that means this Gaius that this book may be directed to was a convert of John, baptized by Paul, and was a wealthy, hospitable member of the church in Corinth that was so charitable as to take people into his home. So that's who the book is directed to. Um, as you see on your sheet there, there are three purposes of the book that are outlined in the book of jo 3 John. Verses 5 to 8, we see that it's to confirm Gaius for his kindness, his hospitality. He's kind of getting a pat on the back from John. Then the middle of the book is to condemn Diotrephes. We're going to slam him around the room a little bit later for his arrogance and his pride because you always have Diotrephes in the church. It's sad, but it's true. And then at the end of the book, it's to commend Demetrius for being a good example. So there's kind of these three people around the book is circulating. You got Gaius in the beginning, Diotrephes in the middle, Demetrius at the end. The key word is truth, and we've said that a lot. John seems to like that word truth. And um, if you look at how he uses it here in 3 John, if you look at verse 1, he says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. So the first thing he says here is that truth, I guess I could write this on the board and pretend like I'm doing something, all right? Um, first, he talks about truth being the source of love, right? I love you in the truth, right? Because that's what causes us to love one another, is the truth. Then if you jump to verse 3, he says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. So now he's talking about truth as an inward presence, something you have or don't have inside of you. And then in the rest of verse 3, he says, They... Um, and testify of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So the third thing about truth is, truth is an outward walk that you manifest in your life or you don't. And then fourthly, he says over there in verse number eight, he says, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. So he's talking about truth being the focus of ministry. We're trying to help the truth. We're trying to, you know, get the truth out. We're trying to teach each other the truth. Amen. And that's really what the focus of ministry is. It's not about love. Uh, it's not about sharing. It's about truth. The most important thing to God is truth. Amen. Um, speaking the truth in love, but speaking the truth. Uh, and then lastly, verse 12 he talks about truth. I'll read it before I write it, because then it'll make sense. He says, um, Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth. So the truth is going to be our judge. He says, the truth gives Demetrius a good report. Our judge. And ultimately, it's the truth of that Bible 
that's going to give you a good report at the judgment seat of Christ. God's not going to measure it against me or against you. He's going to measure you against Jesus Christ, who is the truth. <laughs> and that's who you're going to be measured against. And hopefully, in that day, you'll have a good report of the truth itself. <laughs> that the truth will bear record that you did things according to the book, by the grace of God. And the key verse is right there in verse 8. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. It's the key verse of the book because it's the kind of Christian we ought to be to each other. And the Bible, the third John, holds up this man Gaius for being the right kind of Christian, the right kind of minister. It also shows you the wrong kind of minister in Diotrephes. So the key message is right there in verse 11. I think that's the message of the book. Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. So much about this book is just right way, wrong way. It's a great book. Right way, wrong way. Because you've got the blessings of hospitality that you see in Gaius. You see the blessings of a man that just wants to be charitable and love people and help people. Praise God for every Gaius in the room and in the church. And then the other part of the book is the peril of the domineering leaders like Diotrephes, the ones that are just oppressive, proud, and just lording over God's heritage. That's the wrong way to do it. There's the right way to do ministry and the wrong way to do ministry. And that's why Jesus Christ is pictured in this book as the way. Because so much of this book is about the way you should minister, the way you should interact, the way you should live, the right way and the wrong way. So the breakdown you see on your sheet, Verses 1 to 8, the great service in truth that we see in Gaius. And verses 9 to 14, the great evil of pride that we see in Diotrephes. The right way, the wrong way to be a Christian and a servant of God. So it's going to be a simple message. It might cut close to home. I don't know if it's going to hurt, but it's, John is very blunt. He's very direct. He's very black and white, so to speak. Uh, so let's jump into some of these uh, true is in 3 John. Let's go to, ver to verse 2 here, okay? Um, I should have... <laughs> See that little bag right there? Just take the eraser out for me. Uh, verse 2, all right? Thank you so much, sir. The one thing I didn't I left to take was the eraser. All right? So the first thing I want to talk about, the first truth here, and everything about this is going to be the right way and the wrong way. The whole book is about this this contrast of the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. And the first thing the Bible talks about is the right way and the wrong way to prosper. Because we want to prosper. I mean, if you grow up wanting to be a loser, that's weird. But hopefully you want to prosper in some way. And look at verse 2, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So there's the right way and the wrong way to prosper. You know, the Laodicean church wants to prosper the wrong way, right? Many churches preach a prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel says that God wants you to be rich and healthy. Man, I must be under the judgment of God. Right? <laughs> um, I was looking up quotes today, or yesterday or two days ago, whenever I was, whatever day it was. I don't know. It's all one day. But I was looking up. You've heard of Kenneth Copeland. He's a big dog in prosperity world. I mean, he's got his own plane, he's got his own ministry, he's got t-shirts, I don't know if he's got, you know, a line of underwear, I don't know what he's got, but he's got a lot of stuff named after Kenneth Copeland. I was looking up this quote, he said, you are not created for prosperity. But he said it with those beady little eyes, I can't imitate that well enough, but he said it, you know, with these, you know, you know you're not created for prosperity. I was looking up some things by our good friend Joel Osteen. Uh, I know a lot of you guys got him on Spotify and stuff. But Joel Osteen, he said, with a smile, it's not God's will for you to live in prosperity. It's, no, it's not. It is God's will for you to live in prosperity instead of poverty. Right? If, you, if you are lacking, if you're just trying to make ends meet, if you're going paycheck to paycheck, you are under the curse and the demon of poverty. The demon of poverty. And I actually, look at this verse. Go to 2 Corinthians 8. Some of you are just getting convicted. You're like, oh, no. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Look at this. Go to 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And, you know, if you're watching at home and you don't know me, you don't know us, and it sounds like I'm being mean-spirited, the Bible says to mark people that are telling you things contrary to the Bible. So 
you know, I'm just, I'm not hating on them. I'm not judging them. I'm just showing you that what they're saying doesn't line up with the Bible. If you think God wants you to have a jet in light of all the other things the Bible talks about, then I don't know what Bible you're reading. I guess you have to write your own. But in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, I actually heard this guy. There was this video on Copeland's website, and he actually quoted this verse to suggest that Jesus died to make you rich. I couldn't believe it. It was the most blasphemous thing in the world that I could, I could think about. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, which was a favorite verse of Pastor Mel's. I heard him quote it many times. He said, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And he said, See, see, Jesus doesn't want you poor. I want to be like, Knucklehead, do you know who he's writing to? He's writing to the poorest church in the New Testament. He's writing to the Macedonians who out of their deep poverty were able to give to Paul and to the ministry. And he's being commended that Jesus Christ did the same. It's about sacrifice. It's not about padding your coffers. And it was just crazy. The Bible speaks about true riches in Luke 16, 11. Very interesting verse, right? 16, 11. Of Book of Luke, you find, you got to watch those 1611s, right? You got a 1611 Bible, I hope. But in Luke 1611, Jesus talks about being committed the true riches. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he speaks about the unsearchable riches of Christ, right? There's a right kind of rich. Amen. And if you're saved here today and you're walking with God, you've got the right kind of rich. Amen. I know the world says, yeah, yeah, but you can't afford my car. Okay, in 50 years when your car's an ash heap and you're gathering dust in the ground somewhere and I'm walking the streets of gold and you're weeping and gnashing and bashing your teeth together, we'll see who had the right kind of riches, right? Don't lose perspective. I don't want that of those people. I don't have a chip on my shoulder, but don't lose perspective, people. You've got the right kind of rich if you know Jesus Christ. Uh, you're rich today, just not the way the world says you should be rich, right? The world has a very different version. The prosperity gospel also says that if you're right with God, you'll never be sick. That's the truth. I had a guy in my house one time, I've said this before, when we used to have little Bible studies in my house, and I brought up the account of Mel Sabaka. I've said this before. And I, I gave the account of Mel Sabaka, how Mel Sabaka wanted to get into the cancer ward so bad that God, he says, God gave him prostate cancer so he can get into the cancer ward and witness to the people. And Mel Sabaka, because he did walk on water, I think, a little bit, when he got cancer, he went up to the doctor and he said, God gave me cancer so I could be in here and witness to the people. And the doctor says, don't say that, Mr. Sabaka, don't say that. But Mel knew what he meant. But you know what? I said that to this little lying Pharisee over there, and he was just like, oh, no, no, God would never do that. No, no. And he was casting aspersions that there must have been something wrong in Mel Sabaka's life that God smote him with cancer. I almost threw the guy out of my house. I almost physically picked him up. It was like somebody just insulted my grandfather and called him a piece of trash to insinuate that Mel Sabaka, who wanted to get cancer so he could witness to people with cancer, was given cancer out of some sin in his life. It still drives me crazy to this day. But those are the Job's comforters all around us. There must be something wrong with you that you've been afflicted. That's Job's comforters. That's, that's Satan working through people. And uh, now listen, Isaiah 53.3 says, With his stripes we are healed. I'm going to say something, then I'm going to qualify it. Yes, healing is in the atonement. It is. It just hasn't happened yet. Amen. With his stripes we are healed, but it isn't consummated yet. And I heard a guy say it this way. You know how you know it's not consummated? Stick your hand in a lion's cage. You'll find out that you're not in the millennium yet. You'll find out that the atonement isn't, that that healing isn't consummated yet because that lion's not going to take your hand and just be sitting there eating, you know, grass. It's going to bite your hand off. But one day, a little child will lead that lion around. So one day, yes, there will be healing in the atonement. It's built in when God consummates his plan. Go to Psalm 103. I'll show you. At his first coming, he took care of your soul. At his second coming, he takes care of everything else. Look at Psalm 103. So healing is in the atonement. It's just not happening at the same time. It just didn't happen yet. Psalm 103. Now in the Old Testament, if you were right with God, you didn't get sick. God said, I won't put any of these diseases of Egypt upon you. And one of the signs that Moses was shown was a leprous hand, because when they would step away from God, God would smite them with sickness. But that's, that's all Old Testament stuff. We're not there anymore. 
All right. Psalm 103, verse 2 says this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Colon, he's going to list them. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. That's first coming. Amen? Amen. Semicolon, who healeth all thy diseases. Second coming. Wow. See, healing is in the atonement. Yes. One day, folks, you're all going to be healed. The hips and the cancers and, uh, and, and all the stuff that, that weighs us down, that breaks us down. One day, it's all going to be taken care of. Just not yet. Just not now. When he comes again, he takes care of everything else. So go back to 3 John, please. Does that make sense? How to prosper Amen. the right way. The way to prosper the right way is right there in 3 John 2. He says, I want you to prosper as thy soul prospers. Right? He says right there, as thy soul prospereth. The Lord wants you to prosper the right way. He wants your soul to prosper first. You see, we get it all backwards. We want to get the housing situation fixed. We want to get the, the relationship situation fixed. We want to get the job fixed. We want to get the family fixed. We want to get everything fixed out here. But God says, first I got to fix what's in here. And then God can maybe take care of what's out here. When your soul is prospering, then your life gets in order. But when your soul's out of whack, everything outside of you is out of whack. And you can't get the cart before the proverbial horse. you got to get this taken care of first. And think about it. If the Lord really wanted everyone rich and healthy, boy, did he hate the Apostle Paul. Hmm. Ever think about that? The man who wrote 14 letters in the New Testament? The man who was arguably the greatest Christian we could ever really look back to? I mean, he dies sick broke and alone in a jail cell. Even Jesus Christ died with one piece of, of physical possessions. They, they gambled away his only earthly possession, his garment. He said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So, so much for being healthy, wealthy, and wise. I mean, because two great men that I know of, Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, just kind of died in this life without really anything but what they were wearing, anything but on their back. So that's the right way and the wrong way to prosper. Now secondly, is in verses 3 to 4, the right way and the wrong way to walk. Again, this book is all about the right way and the wrong way because Jesus Christ is the way in this book. Let's read verses 3 to 4. The right way and the wrong way to walk. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know, the Apostle John uses the words walk and truth four times in his letters. Four times he talks about walking and truth. Let's look at them because that sheds a little bit of light on what John means by this. Let's go back to 1 John. Go to just a couple of pages to the left. 1 John chapter 1. Here's the first time he mentions walk and truth. 1 John 1, 6 says, if we, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if you're walking in darkness, you're not walking in truth because the truth is supposed to be a light. Right? The Bible says the commandment is a lamp and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. The truth, the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. If you're not walking according to the light that's given to you in this book, you're kidding yourself. You're walking in darkness. Amen. That's the first, and that's the one that's different. Because if you go to 2 John, 2 John, and so many Christians are just kidding themselves. They're kidding themselves. They make Jesus Christ sick. He loves them, yes, but he just wants, I mean, he just, he's nauseated by them. He's nauseated by their fornication. He's nauseated by their lying. He's nauseated by their instability. If I can get nauseated, he's the Holy One of Israel. He must get nauseated. I mean, the patience and the long suffering of our God we just got to fall down on our face and thank him for it because mm -hmm. if, we, if, if we had the power to shoot lightning bolts like he does, we would have incinerated half the church last week. I mean, he's so gracious and long-suffering and merciful, but we're kidding ourselves to keep doing what the Bible says not to do 
and think God's just up there like, I just love you, you love me, we're a happy family. It's not, no, he's, he's, he wants you to walk right. He wants you to walk in the light as he is in the light. And in 2 John 4, you see another thing about walking in truth, what it does. 2 John 4 says, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. Hold that thought. Go to 3 John 3. He says it again in 3 John 3. I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. You know there's rejoicing in heaven when you walk in the truth. You say, why should I do what the Bible says? For no other reason than it makes heaven happy. <laughs> no other reason that it makes heaven rejoice, that it makes God rejoice. In fact, when you read 3 John 4, and he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know, that's a big homeschool verse, right? There's a whole homeschool ministry called No Greater Joy that like parks on that verse. You know, it's a great verse for parents and children. Yes, but picture that verse as God the Father saying that about you. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, as a dad, you know, I hear about stuff my kids do, who gave this guy a track at a gas station, who witnessed to her friends. You know, I hear about that. You know what that does to me? That makes me rejoice Amen. as a father. Like, wow, what do you think the Father in heaven does when he sees you doing the best you can, walking the best way you know how, trying to follow the book as best you can? It blesses God's heart. So wouldn't you want your walk to bless the Father and put a smile on his face and make Amen. him rejoice? Yes, when you got saved, you rejoice, but he's still happy to see you walking in truth. So that's a big thing. The right way to walk is the way that pleases the Father. Let's go to verses 5 to 10. Here's where we get in now. Here's where we really dig in here. The right way and the wrong way to minister. We've all called to be ministers. We've all in the ministry. The Bible says we have received the ministry of reconciliation. And that's directed to the whole church in 2 Corinthians. Not just the pastor, not just the deacon, not just an evangelist. That's directed to everybody. If you're saved, say amen. Amen. You're a minister. So there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And uh, you're going to notice this is the heart of the book. The heart of the book is this contrast between Gaius, who's the right way, and Diotrephes, who's the wrong way. And we're going to talk about those two people for a few minutes here, because that's really the crux of this book, is these two men. Now I want you to notice in verses 5 to 7, just a little tidbit, just a little tangent here. He says in verse 5, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to the strangers. Then verse 7, Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. So just remember the Jewish flavor of John's epistles. That Jewish flavor of the strangers would be the Gentiles, the brethren would be the Jews in that case. Just remember that, that Jews in the Great Tribulation, that doctrinal application here. I know, just don't put that out of your mind. Just keep that over what we're saying here. In a little bit, it's going to be important. But notice some things about Gaius in verse 5. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to the strangers. Please notice that the first thing about Gaius doing it the right way, and I don't want to write it down here because half of you won't be able to see it, but that he did everything faithfully. He was loyal, he was conscientious, he was reliable, he did things truly. I mean, that is, I'm going to write it anyway, all right? That is the first requirement for the job. The Bible says it is required in stewards that a man be found Faithful. faithful. In God's one ads, the only requirement for the job is faithfulness. Not talent. He doesn't need talented people. Amen. Lord knows, right? He doesn't need uh, a smart people. God knows that. Right? He doesn't need rich people. He needs faithful people. The greatest ability in the ministry, I was told, is reliability. Dependability. Those are some great attributes in, in, in the ministry. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Hold you. Put something in 3 John. First thing we see is that Gaius was faithful. He did everything faithfully. Maybe preached a Sunday school class faithfully, changed the garbage can faithfully, helped his kids faithfully. Whatsoever thou doest, he did it faithfully. Colossians 3.23. Here's the admonition. 
to the Laodicean church. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. I think Gaius did what he did as if he were doing it unto God. When you do everything you do as if you're doing it unto God, that'll make you faithful in a hot minute. You know, think, wow, the way I do my job today, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. The way I, you know, maybe clean the dishes over here, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. The way I help dad in the yard, you're welcome. The way I help dad in the yard, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord, right? All these things. If you did everything, and me too, if I did everything as unto the Lord, that would make me faithful. And that's what I think Gaius had that attitude. I hope you did. See, you know what Diotrephes wanted? He wanted the promotion. He wanted the position. He wanted the preeminence, it said. He wanted to be noticed. And there's a lot of people in the ministry that just want to be noticed. They just want the pulpit. They just want people to see you. I just, you, you have to let me exercise my gifts. Oh, yeah, you want to exercise your gifts? The lawn needs to be cut. You want to exercise your gifts? The bathroom in the church house needs to be grabbed or something like that. that oh, no, no, brother, you don't understand. I've been called to preach. Oh, me too. I was called to preach. Uh, the toilets have to get washed out, you know. Yeah, that's how you get called to preach, right? You gotta, there's a lot of people like that that just want to walk around and just, they want that red carpet rolled right up into the pulpit. They'll sit in the church for a little while. You know, they'll do their token amens. They'll shout really loud. They'll, you know, wave their hands. They'll get real excited. And they're just looking for that moment where they can just get in there and get up at that pulpit and just, you know, show everybody how spiritual they are. That's diatrophies. That's not Gaius. I don't know if Gaius was a preacher. I don't think Gaius, he was just faithful. He just seemed to do, Gaius knew, I think, that you could change a garbage can and preach a message and get the same glory for God out of it. Right? If you can get that mentality, that'll liberate you. That'll, that'll change your day tomorrow. Amen. That'll be like, wow, I'm going out to you know, put somebody's IV in or I'm going to school to take some awful English test. Maybe, I don't know, I hope not. But you know, you know, you're doing all these things. If you say to yourself, wow, everything in my life is an opportunity to serve God and glorify Him, that'll change you. Amen. Instead of waiting for the promotion, and then I'll serve God. No, you got it backwards, son. You got it backwards. You're getting it all backwards. You have to be like, right now, you got a family, you walk into the house at the end of the day, you're a pastor. You're a pastor to your family, guys. You know, Whoever's underneath you, you're a pastor. And you walk out of that house, you're a missionary. <laughs> you get that in your mind. If you just live that tomorrow, change your world. And God may see that and put you into a position of leadership. He may not, but it shouldn't matter. Amen. You should be doing it as unto the Lord. I don't know if Gaius held an office. I don't know if Gaius preached a message. I don't know if Gaius had an online ministry anywhere. I just know that Gaius was faithful. Amen. Faithful. And whatever he did, he was faithful. The atrophies, mm -mm. he wasn't changing the garbage. He was trying to get close to the preacher so he could just tell him how spiritual he was and show off all his knowledge about the Bible. That's, that's diatrophies, right? You look at verse 6, we see the second thing about it. Go back to 3 John. I told you we get heavy when we get in there because that's, that's the bulk of the book. Um, the second thing about Gaius that he's commended for is his charity. His charity. See verse 6? These people that you've been faithful to have borne witness of thy charity before the church. See that Gaius had charity before the church. His life exhibited and manifested God's love in action. Amen. That's what charity is. God loved you, right? He's, he shows you his love. That's this way. And the charity goes out this way. And you don't have to tell people you have charity. You kind of blew it when you have to tell people. By the way, I'm being charitable. charitable. No, no, no. <laughs> That's like when a kid in my school goes, I'm so smart. I'm like, and humble, you know, because I get that, because you blew it. As min the minute you think it, you blew it. So, you know, I'm being charitable now that I'm not going to kill you for scratching my car. No, you blew it. Right? Charity is something you exhibit. It's something others see in you. Gaius is commended by others. Others are testifying to John that, wow, that guy Gaius has got some real charity. That's a blessing, you know. Go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. 1 John 3.18, the Bible says this, John is writing, and he says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
A lot of brethren declare their love. Gaius demonstrated his love. Your love for God is not measured by the volume of your amen or the length of your testimony or all the things you want to say God's doing through you. That is not how you show your love for God. You show your love for God by not having to say anything but just let your life speak. Your charity towards others, your long-suffering, your patience, your mercy, your kindness. That's how you demonstrate your love. In fact, go to 1 Corinthians 8. There's even a Bible verse about that. I'm actually not making that up. 1 Corinthians 8. Some stuff I make up. Let's try to see if you catch it. Now I got you. Now you're paying attention. 1 Corinthians 8. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. It does. It gives you a big head. You know, if you could explain, you know, salvation in the millennium, you think you've arrived. Like, wow, he knows about salvation. He knows the difference between seraphim and cherubim. Some of you are interested right now. You're like, I'm going to look it up. Give me that Larkin book. Let's find out. You think you've, oh, now I've hit the precipice. Now I'm really at the upper echelon. No, you're not. You just have a lot of knowledge between your ears. Right? Charity is the glue that's going to help edify and build the body up. Somebody that's willing to wash somebody's feet. Keep reading. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. See, that's not you making it known. That's somebody else seeing it in your life. That's what we call, excuse me, passive voice in the English language. That means you're not doing it. I'm not declaring it. Somebody else is just seeing it. You're not making it known. It's being known by your life and your testimony. And if any man loved God, hey, Gaius' charity was building up the body. He didn't even know he was doing it. That's just the manner of life he had. So think about your life. Are you building people up or tearing people down? That's the mark of charity. That's charity. Are you building people up or are you tearing people down? Go to 1 Corinthians 13 now. Let's get some more light on charity. The charity chapter. Chapter 13 with 13 verses in it. Wow, that would be a rebellious thing for you to be a charitable person. That would be bucking the trend in a good way. 1 Corinthians 13, written by the 13th apostle. 13 chapters with 13, 13 chapters with 13 verses. That would, be a reb that would be a different thing for those carnal Corinthians. You want to be a good rebel, Corinth? Then try to be charitable instead of selfish and carnal. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, he says it. He says, charity suffereth long. You want to know what charity is? It's right here, laid out for you. He spells it out. Backs the truck up, opens the doors, and here's the payload. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. You say, get that down. You want to get something down? Get those verses down. If I can get those verses down, this would be a Christ-filled church. Amen. We have to teach things, like on Saturday we'll be teaching the rules of interpretation and discipleship too. Yeah, we've got to know those things, but that's, that's head knowledge. This, we need heart knowledge. <laughs> this is heart knowledge, man. This is like stuff to teach you how to live and how to be and how to let the rubber meet the road and be a, be a Christian, not just say you're a Christian. That doesn't, this is, charity is the mark of a mature believer, by the way. The mark of a mature believer is not even how many souls you lead to Christ. That's not the mark of a mature believer. The mark of a mature believer is not how well you can create points in an outline somewhere. That's not the mark of a mature believer. The mark of a mature believer is somebody could step on your toes and you could say, that's okay, brother, I love you. That's the mark of a mature believer. That's charity. He suffers long in his kind. All right, I'll get off that. All right? Go to verse 8. Uh, go back to 3 John, I'm sorry. The last thing about Gaius before I just body slam the atrophies. Verse 8. Gaius was a fellow helper. He was a fellow helper. See verse 8? He says, 
We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Kind of like you are, Gaius. You're a fellow helper. We should be fellow helpers too. He was just a fellow helper. I don't know his title. I don't know his position, his office, how many years he was saved, how many people he led to Christ, how long he'd been in the church, what he gave. I don't know anything. I just know he was a fellow helper. I see no strife there, no competition there, no lordship there, no like, well, you did this, well, look what I did. You know, that happens sometimes, folks. We get into this weird, like, competition thing, like, well, I did this, well, look what I did. And I, you know, we kind of like, we could fall into that real easy. We're just fellow helpers. We're just fellow soldiers. We're just fellow laborers. We're all in this thing together. If next week you lead 100 people to Christ and reach the mountaintop and get transfigured with Jesus, mm -hmm. if I have charity, I should be like, that's great, brother. Praise Amen. the Lord. I'm so happy for you. I'm not like, oh, yeah, well, look what I did. Well, I know what he did. I heard what he said last week. <laughs> Right? That's, that's, that's the atrophies. We'll get to him in a second. All right? Go to verse 9. Let's go into the atrophies now. <clears throat> so we saw the great service of Gaius, and now we see the great evil in diatrophies. This is the wrong way to minister. Di Gaius was right. This is wrong. First thing in verse 9. <clears throat> I wrote unto the church, but diatrophies, who loveth to have the preeminence. Diatrophies wants everybody to notice him. He wants the spotlight, but he never tell you that. He won't say he wants the spotlight. He'll say, it's all God, brother. God did it, God's the one, but he wants the spotlight. You know who he is? He's like Absalom, who hung out in the gate, and when they came to see David, he intercepted them. Oh, I wish that there was somebody that could just take care of your cause and bring your cause to David. All that false humility, that's Diotrephes. His first keynote is he wants to have the preeminence. Now, the Bible says Jesus Christ is supposed to be the one that has the preeminence. <laughs> you know, I know of a certain person that calls himself the preeminence. He lives over in a castle in Italy over there somewhere, right? He calls himself, you know, they title him the preeminence or the eminent one, right? Sorry, Jesus Christ is the only one that, in all things, he should have the preeminence, Colossians 1 says. So, Diotrephes wants it. You know who else wanted the preeminence? Lucifer. Right? He's up there leading the worship in heaven. He's like, wow, look at me. They're all looking at me. Look, I'm, I'm shining the light of God. And, you know, I should be like, I'm, I'm going to be like the Most High. And God said, boom, you're out. <laughs> I only want the preeminence. So, that's the first thing. That's the first thing. He wants the spotlight. He won't tell you he wants the spotlight. That's that voluntary humility that Colossians warns about. You know, he's walking around like, you know, I'm nothing. I'm just nothing. You know, sometimes shame is just pride turned inside out. You know, that excessive, like, just brow. I'm nothing. I'm just a nobody. That person that gets up there and just, bless God, I'm just a nobody. I'm just a poor, wretched sinner, but bless God. Uh-huh. Right. How do you spell that diatrophies? You got two, one P in that name or two? You know, because that, 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 you got to be careful with that stuff. That voluntary humility, that self-debasement, that just constantly, you know, putting yourself down in front of other people, that's like pride turned inside out. That's just you, oh, no, brother, you're so wonderful. No, don't say that about yourself. See, it's just pride that makes you do that. Hey, if you preach a message and somebody says, great job, you just say, praise the Lord. Oh, no, I'm nothing. I'm just a wicked, wretched person. No, that's pride. That's pride. That's diatrophies. Wow, look how humble he is. Oh, you know, there, never mind, I'm going to start singing something. All right, keep going. Verse 9, he says, Among them receiveth us not. Interesting. Where if I come, I will remember his deeds. That's interesting. John, remember sweet John who leaned on Jesus' breast says, I'm going to remember, remember that cat. I remember this guy. John, he was the son of thunder, John. Don't, don't think he was a whip. John's like, I remember diatrophies. I remember what you did, diatrophies. He says, look what he says at the end. He says, Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. You know the second thing about Diotrephes? Not just that he wants the preeminence and he's proud. He's domineering. He wants to control people. He wants to control the church. He's letting who can come and who can't come. Who can have access and who can't have access. How dare you? <laughs> who do you think you are, Diotrephes? Did you think it was your church and your ministry? You proud fool. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at this. I'm glad we don't have folks like this, but 
hopefully you'll smell them when you come around. 1 Peter 5, verse 2. Now, 1 Peter 5, verse 2, let me let you get there. 1 Peter 5, 2, Peter's talking about elders. And look what he says about an elder. He says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not to get paid only, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock, right? The servant of God is not supposed to police people. That's nobody's job. Now, if you've got egregious sin that the elders have to take you aside and maybe put somebody out, I know that happens. It's few and far between, and it's not fun. But that's not the keystroke of ministry. The keystroke of ministry is to be an example, be a lighthouse and a picture and a type that somebody could see something in your life that they could emulate. But don't lord over them. Try to control and micromanage everything. That's not spiritual. That's diatrophies. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Do you like when somebody looks over your shoulder every second? Right? That's diatrophies. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 24. 2 Corinthians 1, 24. Now, 2 Corinthians, if you remember this from last year, so two years ago, study on uh, the manual of ministry, 2 Corinthians, is the manual for ministry. And he gets at the end of the first chapter and he says this. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. You see that? You can't micromanage a seed. Put a seed in the ground. I put some seeds down before all the rain. Yes. So happy. I went to school the next day. The kid's like, it's raining. Why are you happy? I was like, I threw my seed before the rain came. Yeah, right? But I, if I stare at that all day and try to coax it along and move it around, it's not going to grow. You can't micromanage a seed, and you can't domineer God's growth process. Not everybody grows the same way. Not everybody grows at the same rate. You got to be patient and, be, and love people where they are, not where you want them to be, and just you know, pray and water that seed with your tears and try, try to steer it a little bit as much as you can. But you can't, you know, it can't be Charlie Brown you know, trying to get that Christmas tree all set up because you're going to kill it. You put too much on it, it's just going to fall over and, oh, what have I done? That's what you're going to do to another brother or sister in Christ. You know? Hey, this stuff here, hey, by the grace of God, I have not been to the Market Street Mission yet. Shame on me. I don't need to micromanage that. I don't need to micromanage Danny at the Jersey Shore, Jersey Shore Rescue Mission. I don't, I, I've never been to the Arbor Terrace Bible Study. I trust Josh and, and Andrew and the guys to go there. We don't have to, like, I don't have to micromanage everything. Right? I don't have to domineer everything. You should be able to commit things to faithful men who shall be able to treat, teach others also. Right? That's, that's the liberty we have in Christ. This, but the atrophies, oh man, he's like a Baptist Pope. He has to be in every, hey, you're laughing. There's Baptist popes out there, right? They want to be in everything, over everything. Hey, some of you guys get together and have Bible studies in your homes. There's churches that I could name where that would not be allowed to happen, where the pastor would shut that stuff down. And you know it. Some of you have been in other churches, you know it. They'd shut that down. I'm not going to shut it down. Hey, you guys want to get together and study the Bible? Okay. If you start thinking Jesus was a flying saucer or something like that, I might have to rein you back in. But uh, hey, look at verse 10, last thing about him. Last thing, oh, let's go back to 3 John, sorry. I told you this was going to be heavy. <coughs> but it makes sense, right? I mean, this is a, hopefully this is a breath of fresh air and not a, not a diatrophy sermon. Um, verse 10. Verse 10, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. You know what, you know what uh, Diotrephes likes to do? Diotrephes... <clears throat> I'm just going to write it this way. He has a big mouth. He likes to run his mouth. Prating means like just talking smack about people because you're envious about them. You're prating. You're, just, you're, just, you're envious. You're just talking bad about people. And he says, this guy is talking evil against me. He's prating because he's envious. Why? Because he's not content. He's miserable, right? He runs his mouth because he's miserable. He wants everybody else to be miserable like him. 
He can't see anybody else happy, anybody else blessed, anybody else successful. He's got to just be prating and nitpicking. So much so that he wouldn't let John come, it seems. Like, wow, what a guy, what a guy, what a guy. You know what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.11? Study to be quiet. All right? A fool is known by the multitude of words. And Proverbs 10.8 says, a prating fool shall fall. If you just talk and smack about people because you're envious, that's going to destroy you, man. That envy in your heart, you better get a victory over that because it's going to take you down. It's going to take you down. So, whew, let me get off that soapbox. That's the, that's, that's the right way and the wrong way to minister. The last thing is in verse 11, and then we'll, we'll conclude this. All right? <clears throat> I know you can't see this, so I'll say it. We've got the right way and the wrong way to walk. The right way and the wrong way to prosper first. The right way and the wrong way to walk. The right way and the wrong way to minister. And the last one is the right way and the wrong way to see God in your life. Who would like to see God show up in their life? Amen. I don't mean the rapture. I mean like work in your life, in your family, in your situations, in those prayer requests. Well, the Bible has right here the right way and the wrong way to see God in your life. Now, here's where we got to get that double application of 3 John, because doctrinally, this is going to apply to a Jew in the Great Tribulation. Because a Jew in the Great Tribulation, and I don't understand it all, I'll confess it, I don't think anybody does, but he's going to see an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Tribulation. Right. Before he comes back, he's going to see some kind of appearance of Jesus Christ in the Great Tribulation. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. I'll show you a few verses that mention that. Again, these are books that are not aimed at the church, so we're gone, right? We're out of here at this point. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, the last verse. Hebrews 9, 28. <clears throat> so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So there's some kind of appearing of him that goes on in the Great Tribulation where somebody sees him. Uh, I'll show you another verse about that. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. We were just there. Go to the right a little bit and go to 1 Peter chapter 5. When you read through the book of Revelation and you read the Tribulation accounts, they see him. It seems like they see him. Before he comes back, they see an appearance of him. And in 1 Peter 5 verse 4 it says, And when the chief shepherd shall... Appear. appear. Amen. You shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Again, that's not... Now, we could spiritualize that for the church, but that's not a church epistle. Right? Go to uh, 1 John chapter 2. It's another one. First John chapter 2, verse 28. First John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we shall have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So somehow Jesus Christ appears during the Great Tribulation to a people that are walking right. Because 3 John said, I didn't read the verse. That's a shame on me. I didn't read the verse in 3 John 11. I didn't read it. I wrote this up here. But it says in 3 John 11, Beloved Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Oh, now, this is where John gets really tricky because we could spiritualize that, but doctrinally, what does that mean? Wow. Somebody in the tribulation is seeing Jesus Christ show up because they're walking right, and some people maybe aren't. Kind of reminds me of those Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. They stood for God, and guess who showed up? Jesus, right? He was there with them in the fire. That's a picture of tribulation, because Nebuchadnezzar is the Antichrist, and they're in the fire, and who shows up because they're walking right, and they're following God, despite persecution? There's the Son of God with them. So it seems like if you, and I'm, I know I don't understand it all, I confess it, but it seems like in the tribulation, if you do good, there's an appearance somewhere, somehow, of Jesus Christ. Um, go to Matthew chapter 5. I'll show you just a little more about that. Matthew chapter 5. I am almost done. Matthew 5, verse 8. Here's our Sermon on the Mount, our Constitution of the Kingdom, our, you know, what is the millennium going to be like? 
And what does he say about the blessing? He says in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now take that literally. Take that as a Jewish promise to physically see Jesus Christ if you do good, like John says, you need to see, do, do good to see God. Now, go to James chapter 4, last verse on this. James, towards the back of the Bible, I know we're flipping a lot, a lot of verses here, and we're not really even scratching the surface on this, but I'm just trying to present a thought to you. Maybe you can mine it out a little further. But James chapter 4, verse 8, notice how, this, notice how James 4, 8 echoes what Jesus said in Matthew. Sounds very similar. James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to draw nigh to God? Clean yourself up, and God takes a step towards you as you take a step towards Him. Right? So there's a, I know we just touched it on it, but there's a whole doctrinal application to God, a seeing God in the Great Tribulation, seeing Jesus Christ in the Great Tribulation. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 12, which is the book right before this, we could spiritualize this a little bit. Let's make a spiritual application. Let's read Hebrews 12, 14. Let's read it both ways, okay? Let's read it doctrinally first. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So, doctrinally, You've got to be holy in the Great Tribulation to literally see Jesus Christ. That's the direct application of that verse. But spiritually, we can apply this to a Christian right now who wants to see Jesus Christ show up and work in his life. Right? Spiritually, you've got to be holy if you want others to see Jesus Christ in you. Nobody's going to see Jesus Christ in you if you're living like a pig like them. Nobody's going to see Jesus Christ in you if you're acting like you were before you were saved. They've got to see a difference. And you're not going to really see God start to show up in your life until you start really living right. You've got to start doing the things He says. You know what D.L. Moody said? He said, A holy life will produce the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns. They only shine. See that? You shine holiness... Just doing right, that's going to make a deep impression on people. Holiness will allow other people to see the Lord right now. right? Another old divine, J.C. Ryle, said, People may refuse to see the truth of our arguments, but they cannot evade the evidence of a holy life. They may not want to hear your witness. They may want to see your reasons. They may not care about the sermon that you preach, but they're watching the sermon that you live. Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Yes, doctrinally, I know it's got something to do with that Jew in the Great Tribulation who's living right, avoiding the Antichrist, and gets an appearance of Jesus Christ coming for him. But it also means for me right now, if I want my neighbor to see Christ, my co-workers to see Christ, and me to see Christ show up in my life, I've got to start living right. Amen. Good old-fashioned holiness. That's a good Bible word, right, sister? Holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Stop cussing, stop messing, stop doing stuff. Get the junk out. That's part of the Christian life. And if you want God to show up and work in your life, do good. Amen. God doesn't pick up dirty tools. He doesn't want to pick up dirty tools, do you? You want to pick up a screwdriver that's covered in sludge or one that's nice and shiny in the toolbox? What do you think God wants to pick up and use? He wants to pick up the one that's clean and shiny. He doesn't want to pick up the one that's just living like a pig. Right? So, holiness. So, you want to see God show up? Do right. All right, go to Psalm chapter 1. Let's finish it with one big idea. I got one big idea from the book, and then we'll, we'll, we'll nail it home. What am I doing here? All right, almost there. I'm just about there. Here's the big idea, Psalm 1. <clears throat> you can choose to go the right way or the wrong way for God. That's the big idea. That's it. <laughs> How spellbinding. You can choose to go the right way or the wrong way for God. You could choose the right way for God or the wrong way for yourself. You could choose, right? Now, doctrinally, Gaius and Diotrephes, they represent the wise man and the foolish man. And doctrinally, 
Israel in the Great Tribulation is going to have to decide, are you going to be the wise man or the foolish man? Are you going to build your house on the rock and let it stand the storm? Are you going to be a fool that builds his house on the sand and watches it sink? That's what the whole book of Psalms is about. That's the key to unlocking all your blessings. The wise man and the foolish man. Psalm 1.1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's the key to the whole book. That's about you today. That's about Israel in the Great Tribulation. Some of them are going to be like a wise man, get their house built on a rock, and they're going to stand, their leaf's going to prosper, they're going to go into that millennium and be by those rivers of water, and hallelujah. Some of them are going to be fools that lose everything. Who are you going to be? Right? You can, the wise man, Gaius, for the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The wise man, Gaius, will be blessed. The foolish man, Diotrephes, will be judged. Now let's finish in 3 John, right here. One more time with feeling. Third John. We'll round it out right here. You got to choose. You got to choose. Choose ye this day. You got to choose. Cut your excuses out. Forget your excuses. But I got no excuses. You could choose to go the right way or the wrong way. And your way, which is the wrong way, is really the devil's way. And look how the book ends. Third John 12. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself, yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly come unto thee, shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Notice in verse 12, the letter ends with John commending a good example, Demetrius. Notice in verses 13 and 14, he also ends the letter reminding them that they would soon see him face to face. Folks, like John, the Lord is coming soon. He's going to see you face to face at the judgment seat of Christ. Eyeball to eyeball. You're going to look at those eyes of fire. You're going to see them. You're going to see the holes in his hand. You're going to see the marks in his brow. You're going to look upon that face. Beyond the Bible, you're going to see him face to face. Will he commend you in that day for being a good example like Demetrius? Or will he deny you a reward in that day for being a bad example like Diotrephes? You're all going to be some kind of examples. You're going to either be a good example or a bad example. You choose what kind of example you want to be. You could choose to be a wise man who does things right and gets rewarded, or you could choose to be a foolish man who does things his own way and suffers loss. But make no mistake, Jesus Christ is coming to see you face to face very soon. So I implore you, make the right choice. Make the right choice. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you today. We thank you today. We just thank you for this challenging book. I pray I could live it, Father, and not just speak it. I don't want to be a castaway, Lord, when I've said this to others, Lord. Help me, Lord, to just live these things. Thank you for the truth of it. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that unlocks these things and unearths these things and teaches us these things, Father. The things of God knoweth no man but by the Spirit of God. So we thank you, Lord, for sending your Spirit into this book, Lord, and into our hearts to understand it. Pray, Lord, we can apply it, live it, be a better church, be better parents, be better friends, be better Christians because of it. Just send us out of here with your blessing, Lord, your protection, and bring us together safely, Lord, for all the things happening. If you give us a weekend, may all these things unfold for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.